There are some things that we can absolutely do, but it's when we've exhausted all of those things, exhausted all of those options that we can feel really calm and confident that for some reason, baby's sitting pretty and I just have to trust that in this moment they know best because we can't see inside and they're just going off of what's going to be best for them. Welcome to the first podcast that I am recording for 2024. Yes, you have heard a couple by now, but this is the first one I get to record for this year. And I'm really excited to record it because it is a direct topic from you guys that you've been asking for. And honestly, I keep getting questions about this topic, which we're going to talk about breach and all things breach in just a moment. But I keep wanting to refer back to a podcast because I'm like, I know I've talked about this. I know I've had this conversation and yet I have not had it this clearly before. So now I will have a podcast to link you directly back to. Also, this is stuff that we all, it's completely covered in the birth course, which is why I think it probably is in my mind that I'm like, I talk about this all the time. It's covered. It's in the resource section. There's all this stuff, but it's not on the podcast. So (laughs) if you're in the birth course, no worries. You've already had this. Um, And if not, follow along here and it will give you many, many of the things that you need. But before we get started, I want to honor this person and this year by starting off with a reviewer of the week. So if you guys leave me reviews, um, not only do I absolutely love it and I get to read some of them on here, but it is the best way to help this podcast show up in other people's searches um, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen. If you are able to leave a review This is what helps the podcast get into more hands. And the more I get to hear from you guys, especially as these like birth stories and stuff that I've been able to do these um, interviews with you guys come up, that is like the number one thing that I get to hear from you is thank you so much. Or I found this podcast and I'm just so grateful for the information that's out there. I feel like what I'm doing personally isn't anything special in the sense that I feel like everybody should know it. But the truth is, there are many, many women that don't. And if you're here, you might be one of them. So um, this is an opportunity for you guys to say what you love about the podcast. And hopefully that can help other people to get knowledgeable about their birth and their situation and feel really empowered and really ready for their labor and their birth and even on into motherhood. But let's start with our reviewer of the week, which is, mm, should have practiced this one, Nyxnil, Nyx. Anyways, N-A-H-Y-C-N-I-L. Thank you for your review. She says, so grateful for this podcast for making my unmedicated birth possible. I first heard of the My Essential Birth podcast through someone's TikTok post and started listening to it on my commute to work around the end of second trimester slash start of third trimester. It was going to be my first birth and I knew I wanted to do it unmedicated if possible, but I had no idea what to do to prepare myself. I listened to all of the episodes that mentioned unmedicated births, and it gave me hope that not only could it be possible, but it can be a positive experience as well. I got the unmedicated birth that I wanted, and my daughter was born exactly on her due date. I absolutely love sharing my birth experience with others. Thank you, Stephanie, for your wonderful podcast. Thank you for sharing... um, for sharing your experience with others because sharing our births, our positive births is, I mean, it's what it's all about. It's how we help spread the word. But thank you for everything that you wrote about the podcast and for being here listening along. So for today, this is what I want to dive into. I want to talk to you guys about breach birth, what it is, what it isn't, um, what you can do if this sounds like you're possibly going to lean this way. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Or if you're like in those later part of pregnancy, those last couple of weeks, and you're like, oh, shoot, I am breached. What do I do? I'm going to give you all of that information here. We're also going to talk about how to prevent it because the best medicine is prevention, right? So let's talk about what it is. Uh, First of all, early on in pregnancy, your baby has the room to flip and turn around in your belly and spin around and somersault and all of the fun, crazy stuff that you get to feel them doing all day long. Funny enough, with my first birth, when we had our first ultrasound, don't ask me how many weeks I was, this was a while ago. But I remember my baby was literally doing somersaults and I asked her, I was like, is he doing somersaults that looks like what's happening? And she just laughed and said, yes, he definitely is. Um, He kind of came out that way (laughs) into his life. He has an energetic body. He is constantly moving. Somersaults were just the start. So that was really fun for me to be able to see on there. But in other words, that baby has a lot of room within your belly when they are tiny. They move all around. So it's totally normal for them to be in all kinds of different positions. As we get later into our pregnancies, 
you generally want to see them heading in a more head down position. But I'm talking much later where that actually matters. So I hear moms that get back to me on the ultrasound scan at 20 weeks when they, you know, check for all of these things and they look at the anatomy and all that kind of stuff. They're like, he was breech. What do I do? Nothing. You do absolutely nothing. Um, Transverse, whatever position they're in, sideways, whatever, it's totally fine. 20 weeks is not the time to be worrying about that at all. It's very, very normal for them to be in all kinds of positions. Once you hit around the 30 plus week mark, then your provider starts checking and may or may not mention the position of your baby. Even at that though, 30 30 weeks, 33 weeks is probably where you want to start paying attention to like, what are they doing? You know, how often are they in that position? Do they move from being breech or transverse to other positions? Do they favor one position over another? Um, And particularly if they're favoring a position other than head down, that's something to pay attention to. Now, there are different positions that baby can be in. Even though they are head down, they can be leaned to the left or to the right. We always say left occiput anterior is that like ideal position for a baby. And that's where their body is leaning to that left side. Um, but they can be on the right side too. Um, they can even have their back directly against your stomach. There are different directions that they can be facing even though they're head down. Same with you know, their head coming straight out, sunny side up, meaning their back is to your back. There's all different positions. Um, We like to see them generally leaned to the left or to the right. They say preferably to the left. Uh, But in other words, head down and leaned left or right is probably the very best position that they can be in, the best being that left side. Now, transverse means that your baby is laying sideways in your belly. So their head is on one side of your belly and their bottom or their feet are on the opposite side of that belly. Breach, there are two kinds of breach. Well, I guess there's three kinds of breach. You have a complete breach, which is the bottom coming down and the knees bent, putting their little feet next to their bottom. Um, Kind of think of the fetal position that you would find a baby in. So their, their knees are bent and their feet are head, they're like down where their bottom is. And all of that is down towards the bottom of your belly. Now, frank breech is where the baby is bottom down, but the legs are sticking straight up with the feet right by the face. So that is another way that babies can be. I've actually seen a baby born that way. And then you've got footling breech. So this is a baby's foot or feet that are presenting first and during labor would actually come out first before anything else. Um, I have not seen this born in person, but it absolutely happens. And so there are different, you know, positives or or um, things to be concerned about versus not things to be concerned about when it comes to breach. Now, how will you know if your baby is breech? Now, around 30 weeks is generally when a provider starts feeling around and checking if baby is in a good position or not. If you are someone that has chosen to have vaginal exams, which are they are not necessary during pregnancy, you can absolutely say no to these. But should you choose to have vaginal exams during any of your appointments around 30 weeks, something that they're feeling for is to tell if baby is head down. So they'll feel that cervix. They'll push up against the cervix. If the cervix is dilated at all, they'll have a finger or two in there and you'll be able to tell, is it squishy? Is it hard? Um, things feel all kinds of ways down there. But the other way that they tell is by palpating the uterus or in other words, like pushing on your stomach from the outside. And that can tell them, um, especially like up high where the stomach is and down low where your pelvis is, also on the sides where a bottom is and where a head is. Now, I will say this from both personal and professional experience that this is a skill And some providers are better at it than others. Um, I have had providers tell a mom that a baby was absolutely for sure a certain direction and they were not and vice versa. So I would just ask a lot of questions to your provider as they're checking. How do you know? How can I tell? You know, what do I feel? And I will tell you right now um, when you're talking position. So and I had a breech baby. I had a breech baby around 35 weeks with my third. And then we were able to successfully flip him, which I will talk about in this episode, um, what you can do as well if this is the case for you. But one of the ways that we could tell is at the top of my stomach where you feel some hardness or density, I would push against that and little heads 
bob back. So a bottom, when you push against it, doesn't like wiggle around and bob like a head does. And you can kind of tell if you put your fingers on either side of that um, that hardness that you're feeling, if you just like push it back and forth, what does it do? If you push on the top of it and push down a little bit, does it kind of like fling right back? That is one way to tell. And then also pay attention to where your kicks are. Sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes you really can't tell. But sometimes it, it you really it gives you an idea of where that baby is. So if you're feeling, I think this is the head, I think this is the bottom, you know, are my kicks on my left or right side, then that can give you an idea of what position your baby's in. But some midwives especially are very, very skilled at this. Or if you've seen any of the belly mapping stuff, which if you are somebody who got the bonuses like for Black Friday or in December and you chose the belly mapping guide, that's you can just follow along with that and it'll teach you how to map where your baby is on your belly. But some providers will tell you one thing, others are going to tell you a difference. So just make sure that your provider actually knows what they're talking about when it comes to that. Um, and then they can tell you what position they think your baby is in. If for some reason they do suspect that your baby is in a preach position, they're likely going to send you for an ultrasound in order to be able to check that. Once they send you for the ultrasound, I guess I'll get into that in a little bit. There's all kinds of things that happen once you go for the ultrasound. If baby's not in a breech position, then right, no big deal. Oh, great. We were wrong. Incorrect. Great. That's wonderful. They're in a good position. If they are breech, there's different things that happen and I'll go over that in just a bit. But as far as why your baby ends up in that position, sometimes we don't always know. Sometimes it can be um, the shape of your uterus or even the space that baby has. So something we'll talk about later is Webster's technique, for example, with a chiropractor. Something that you can do if you have a breech baby is go see a chiropractor and they do something called the Webster's technique. And what it's really doing, it's not changing your bone structure or anything like that, right? We have the bones that we have and the ligaments that we have, but it does loosen some things and puts things in a better position to create more room in the uterus for baby to move around. And then they can get into the position that they're trying to get into that they might be being squeezed out of because of the the space that they have where they're at inside right now. But if I will I will just list a couple of things that are said to contribute to breech babies. Factors that may contribute to this um, are if you are pregnant with multiples and it can be really common for one baby to be breech and the other to not be breech and depending on who's presenting first. Anyways, it's a whole thing. If you have a history of premature births, if you have too much or too little amniotic fluid, if you have an abnormally shaped uterus or a uterus with abnormal growths, if you have placenta previa, which is a low-lying placenta that may block room for a baby's head, Uh, if you have a cord wrapped around the baby, And there can be a possible imbalance of the uterus, meaning mom's ligaments and pelvis may or may not be out of alignment. Uh, Generally speaking, I will say this for babies that for whatever reason, they are breech and we pull out all the stops and mom has done everything. There is generally a reason that baby has decided not to turn down. And so I'll probably talk about that a little bit later on in the episode as well. But just know, like when it's talking about cord being wrapped around the baby, for example, and that's not always a reason that a baby will be breached. It's not always a reason for a baby to be breached. But in other words, there just there are certain things that you notice, like if a baby is their breech, they're not moving. Um there's a reason that they're there. So it's. I think it's really helpful to trust our babies, trust our bodies, um, and also realize that we do have a certain amount of help that we can encourage them one direction or another. There are some things that we can absolutely do, but it's when we've exhausted all of those things, exhausted all of those options, that we can feel really calm and confident that for some reason, baby's sitting pretty, and I just have to trust that in this moment, they know best because we can't see inside And they're just going off of what's going to be best for them. I do want to talk about prevention, though. So the truth is, in the way of prevention, there's not a ton that you can do per se. Um, And there's also some things that can make a great difference. So I say that it's kind of like this caution because I don't ever want to say anything that is like, if you do this, this is going to be your outcome or this won't be your outcome, especially when we're talking about pregnancy and birth, because first of all, that's not fair. Um, And secondly, like, I don't want you to blame yourself by any means. And 
things with birth, like as much as we want to say, it's definitely going to be this way if you do X, Y, and Z. That's just never the case. And of course, you will be the mom that I'm going to say this and it's, you know, you're going to have the opposite effect. So with that caution in place, there are some things that you can do that we believe are really strongly in the positive for helping to prevent this condition. So if you have not downloaded the three daily exercises that I recommend that you do, I'm going to ask you to pause this episode right here down, like scroll down wherever you're listening. It should be right below where I am talking right now. And also in the show notes at myessentialbirth.com forward slash podcast, find this episode and it's in those show notes, but there should be a direct link to the three exercises. I recommend that you download and start today. Uh, It doesn't matter how early you are in pregnancy. doesn't matter how late you are. You can do them every single one of them right now. But one of them in particular is the forward leaning inversion. And this forward leaning inversion is wonderful. One of the things that it helps do is to create that room in the pelvis um, by releasing certain ligaments. And so when you are getting into that position, and it's so easy, it really is. It is something that you do once a day. You do it for about three breaths and that's it. So you might need some help getting down into that position and getting up from that position. But overall, it allows your baby the right amount of space in the uterus to be in a good position. And it's going to help you to feel healthy, strong, good, um, really much better in that area and in the back. So all the good reasons to go and do the three exercises. But the other thing that you can do is to make sure that you are kind of like good body mechanics. So if you are sitting in a chair all day, don't be slouching. Don't be, you know, curling your pelvis in, rounding your back, that kind of stuff that we are all guilty of doing. So don't beat yourself up because we know we're going to have some of this, but be, be conscious of those things. So if you can bring a birth ball or a yoga ball with you to work or when you're on a computer or when you're watching TV, um, or if you're able to be in a squatted position or any time that you think of, maybe you are sitting and you're not going to use the birth ball. It just is what it is. And you're in the computer chair, whatever. Then take a, a couple of moments several times throughout the day. If you can get into a hands and knees position and do some of those pelvic tilts, those are also one of the exercises. So be thinking of ways that we can be good to our bodies. Anything that's going to allow you to be in a more upright position with your pelvis kind of like aligned Uh, with your spine. So like a nice straight spine is going to be really good for you. Overall, if you can stick to those three exercises, and I really like to say if you can do the pelvic tilts before you get into bed um, at night and right after you get out of bed in the morning, that's like the first thing that you can do to kind of like align everything, strengthen everything and allow things to be good and then followed up by that forward leaning inversion. But we do what we do. And then the rest really is up to baby and what happens inside. So If you find out that your baby is breech and you are in that early third trimester, take a deep breath. You absolutely have time to do some things that are going to encourage baby to turn. Some babies wait until labor starts to turn. Some moms are not afforded that opportunity to see if that will happen. It will depend on your provider, um, your comfort level, and where you're giving birth. So just keep that in mind. But no matter what, even if you are with a home birth midwife, and some of them absolutely do give help you give birth to breech babies, and that is a wonderful thing. But most of them, including my midwife, who would have happily delivered my baby breech, encouraged me to get that baby to turn. She's like, it will be an easier, more comfortable labor for you. If that baby is head down, like you will dilate easier, your contractions will be um, just a little bit better in the way of like moving baby down and all of that. It's just a different sensation. It is. uh, It's just different. So she encouraged me. She goes, it will be better for you if we can get that baby to turn. And that's all she had to say. I was like, okay, then we will do that. And I'll talk about all of those things in a moment. But oftentimes, especially if you are with a provider in a hospital setting, they are going to encourage you to have an ECV, which is an external cephalic version, meaning they are wanting to manually put one hand on baby's head and the other on baby's butt and spin them around from the outside. Now, 
I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute too. They generally want to do that around 37 weeks or closer to you giving birth. And that's because they want that baby, once they turn them, they need it to be tight enough of a space to stay in that position. But that is the tricky part because you also need to have enough room to turn the baby. So again, I'll get to that in just a moment. But a lot of times, if a baby is in a preach position, maybe they mention the ECV. Most of them probably will. And and when I talk about that, I'll talk about the importance of finding somebody that they need to know what they're doing. But once they decide ECV or whatever, a lot of times the next the next sentence is, and if that doesn't work then we need to make sure that we've got a C-section on the schedule. So there are some OBs that are comfortable delivering breech babies. Um, There are some home birth midwives that are comfortable delivering breech babies. But, and I don't know about as far as in hospital, I think that would be like a case-by-case basis. You have to check with your particular midwife at your particular hospital if that is something that is allowed in that hospital. Oftentimes, if you have a breech baby, it immediately moves you to having to meet with an OB. So you'll just have to speak with your providers. But as far as OBs that do deliver breech babies um, in hospital, you will just need to do some research and see if you can find them. So we have one in Utah, for example, and it was at a training hospital and there's a provider there that that did breach and he trains other people to do breach. And that is a wonderful thing. I also, it just bedside manner was probably not my favorite. And then the situation with how many people are in there for a breach birth, it is a massive delivery room lots and lots of students. And we I think the only reason I even made it into that birth as a doula was because there were two of us doulas that were attending this birth where we were supporting this mom. I think the doula would have been completely kicked out. And that was really upsetting to know that the other doula couldn't be there, but they could have a good 10 to 15 students watching just because it's a breach birth and everybody wants to see. I feel like that's really unfair to mom. So in other words, even if you find a provider that that offers this option, check into what that looks like. And I'm not saying that that was a bad decision by any means. It was great for this mom. She had a wonderful birth and it was it was absolutely wonderful. So but you should know what you're getting into. I think that's only fair. So just kind of my caveat there. But like I had said, depending on state laws, regulations, all that kind of stuff, even if you do have a midwife who maybe she's comfortable with breech babies or whatever, but it's not legal. Even if she's done it before in other states, it's not legal where she's currently practicing. You may or may not have to transfer care. So that is something to be thinking about as well. Now, let's talk about how to encourage a baby to flip down on like all of the natural things that you can do. And then I will go into that ECV, which is definitely a little bit more medical and hands-on. Probably the first thing that you'll hear me say, and many other people, if you have a breech baby and you're looking to do something natural to begin the process of trying to get them to flip, is chiropractic care. So you're going to find a Webster certified prenatal chiropractor. And I mean, they don't need to be necessarily prenatal, but the truth is if they are Webster certified, they have taken some kind of prenatal chiropractic training. So, and along with that, I would ask the chiropractors like, hey, what are the success rates of the women that come to you and do this technique and you see that their baby flips? Um, Some will have greater success rates than others. And this is not them flipping your baby. So keep that in mind. That's not what we're asking. But it is good information for you trying to figure out which provider I want to go to. Um, for this technique. And then you need to see them regularly. It's probably two to three times a week until baby flips. So yes, that's a financial investment. Yes, it's a time investment. If it works, it's going to be a thousand times percent worth it. If it doesn't, you might be a little bit upset. (laughs) But you want to be able to try all of the things. And this is definitely what I did when I had a breech baby. So I will say I did and we did not have the money to be doing that. But I absolutely did spend that money. And I did it for probably two weeks where I saw her two or three times a week. And then when baby did flip, it was like, okay, now we're damage control. We just once or twice a week as needed. Um, And my midwife would make sure to check baby's position. Now, It was not just chiropractic care alone. There are other things that you can be doing and I will get into all of that. But in between your visits with that chiropractor, 
forward leaning inversion every single day for three breaths. This is where you kneel on the edge of a couch. And again, you can download these free, three free exercises and it'll be in there. There's a video, there's audio, there's stuff, there's, there's a bunch of bonuses and stuff that come with it so you can follow along. But you will kneel on the edge of the couch and hold on to something so that you can lower yourself down. Maybe have your birth partner there with you, put a pillow or something below you. Um, and you kind of let your head hang and you're actually going to tuck your chin to your chest as you do this and your bum goes straight in the air. Nice straight spine, bottom in the air, um, chin tucked to your chest and you just hold and hold like three long breaths um, and you can kind of sway your hips if you want or just stay in that position um, and that's it. Like three breaths and then you can make your your way back up. Nice, easy, have somebody there to help you one time a day. It lengthens the ligaments in the lower uterus and it helps to create space in the pelvis. Now, you're going to follow that up with the breech tilt for up to 20 minutes. Now, I did a modified version of this because they tell you to grab something like a solid piece of wood or an ironing board or something like that and then put it at a 45 degree angle propped against like a bed or a couch or something. I did not do that. <coughs> Sorry. I did not do that, but I did something similar. So I put a bunch of pillows <laughs> and it worked. So I'm going to, I'm going to offer this as an option. Um, I put a bunch of pillows on my couch, kind of in that 45 degree, basically just to help me keep my bum up a little bit. And then I put a bunch of pillows on the floor so that I could have my head on the floor. And I turned on the TV and I would watch a show for 30 minutes while I was doing this breech tilt that they talk about. And I did it several times a day. I'm going to encourage you. Same thing. One to three times a day. Um, while I did the breech tilt, I was putting ice on the top of my belly. So you want the ice to get their head cold so that they're like, oh my gosh, I don't like this. I'm going to turn away from it. Then you put like a flashlight down at the bottom of your belly because babies are attracted to light. So if you put the flashlight down there, it's cold up here and there's light down there. What's going on? Let's maybe make a switch. And uh, you will also put soft music and be careful that it is actually soft because I will tell I remember like trying to play music for my firstborn while he was in my belly and he was just like hitting it and hitting it. And I'm like, oh, he likes it. I think it was too loud. He did the same thing like when he would have a sonogram. So anyways, different conversation for a different day, but do the music soft, but so that they can hear there's something going on down there. So they're like, oh, wait, I want to go check that out. And then there is an awful acupressure point. <laughs> I say awful because it hurts. But if it hurts, then it means you hit the right spot. It's on the outside of your pinky toe and you get a clothespin and you put it on the outside of the pinky toe, like right where the nail is. You will know when you've hit it because it does hurt a bit and you will leave that clothespin there. I left it the entire time I was laying down. So you'll do that, like I said, one to three times a day. Uh, the other thing that my midwife told me to do if you have stairs and if you don't go find somewhere that has stairs is you do frog walks up the stairs. So that looks like your hands, like you're in like a, a squatted position with the hands in front of you and you do one leg at a time crawling up the stairs. It's just going to help tilt that pelvis and baby around. You're just moving all those things around so that you can help that baby be in a better position. The other thing you can do is some rebozo sifting. So in a hands and knees position, your birth partner or anybody who can help you is going to place a sheet or rebozo, whatever you have, top of your belly to the bottom of your belly. You're going to wrap that all around that part. And while you're in hands and knees, they're going to have their hands on either side of the sheet and they're just going to sift it like they were sifting apples. You're just going to shake it a little bit. You're just shaking up that baby, shaking up that belly uh, and giving them kind of an opportunity to be in a better position. I've done this with moms. And when I do it, I actually, so you straddle over the mom. So she's got head in the front, bottom you know, behind her hands and knees and I'm straddled over her. My face is facing her head and I actually lean forward. So I'm pulling the sheet forward. Think of lifting that baby up and out of the pelvis, not just up, but like pulling them towards mom's upper half and um, lifting and giving a little bit of a shift that way just to, again, create a little more space at the bottom and a little less space at the top. So you're kind of squeezing that baby in there and encouraging them to move around. Um, Another thing that you can do is 
a gentle massage on the outside. Now this works for it can it can work for helping a baby turn from posterior to anterior, but also just like a slow motion, especially if baby is laying one side or the other. For example, if baby's head is at the top and the their left part of their body is on mom's left side, you're going to gently massage that baby in a circle in the direction that you want them to go. So you want that head to go down towards the side that doesn't have the baby's body on it all the way down to the other side. So you're just making these circles. So you're just encouraging that baby to be in those circles. I would say prayer is another one um, if you're spiritual at all. And also talking to your baby. That's another one. I don't know if you want to call it spiritual, intuitive, whatever, but you are very in tune with your baby during pregnancy and well, during all times, but when you were pregnant with that baby, um, you're very closely linked, obviously. And so something that I did on top of everything that I've just mentioned and everything that I'm going to encourage you guys to do is whether it's in the bath or wherever I laid in the bath, I would talk to my baby and just let him know, I need you to turn. This labor is going to be more comfortable for us. You know, let's get into a good position. I know you can do this. Whatever you decide to do, um, talking to the baby and lots of prayer, I think can be really helpful getting us into like a positive, good state. Along with that, I would encourage you to do some positive affirmations. My baby is going to turn. They um, they know how to get into the best position for labor. Whatever is going to make you feel good and happy about the situation, um, that's what I would do. And let's move on to the ECV. So external cephalic version is that manual manipulation of the baby from the outside of your belly. Your provider is going to want to do it in a hospital setting because there is a risk of the placenta coming off of the uterine wall. And so in the event, they'll be keeping track of mom and baby while they're doing this. In the event that something like that does happen, then you're already at the hospital and they can do the cesarean you know, like an emergency cesarean of something like that happen and get baby out. It's also why they do it later during that like 37th week after 36 weeks, because if something happens and baby is born, then we want to give them the best chance of not ending up in the NICU and all that kind of stuff. So your baby is, and what they do is they Sometimes sometimes you have an IV, sometimes you do not. Sometimes a provider will offer an epidural, sometimes they will not. That is something that was offered to me when I let a provider know in with my third birth that I had a breech baby. Um, well, I like to, you know, give my give my people an epidural. This is a provider that he was not my provider. Um, but he said I, I could meet with him at the hospital and he would do this. Anyways, but wanted to do an epidural because you don't want to feel any pain. Like it is kind of painful. So if you get the epidural and I'm like, did you just miss everything I said about going unmedicated, having a home birth, everything? It was like out the door. So sometimes you will be offered an epidural. You do not need to take it. Yes, it may be uncomfortable. You may want to take it. That is an option, but it is not required. So um, then they like juice up your belly with all of that good stuff, KY jelly, whatever they got. And they gently and also firmly manipulate that baby, move that baby into a better position. Now, if you are going to have the ECV and say that you've done all these other things, like you're, you know, you put the ECV on the books and you do all those other natural things in the meantime, and those other things don't work and you want to have this ECV. First of all, you need to find a provider that has a very high chance of being able to turn that baby, a high success rate. There are providers, all different kinds of providers that do ECVs. Um, Many OBs will say, yes, I can do that for you. And then if it fails, we'll schedule your cesarean. And oftentimes it doesn't work. But some providers have a very high, like 85% success rate of turning a baby and others do not. So it is very important. And I mean, it might, may or may not offend your provider, but too bad. It's your baby. It's your pregnancy. Uh, it's your birth. So I would find the provider, whether or not it's your provider that has a high success rate. And just like anything else, um, you will reach out to other moms that have been in a similar situation around you that you can start asking those questions to. But it's typically done, like I had said, between 36 to 38 weeks. And it's one of those tricky things where you want there to be enough room that when you're turning, baby turns, but not too much room that if you turn, baby turns right back. So it is kind of a tricky spot and you and your provider can go over that together. 
But all the other things, you can start doing that right away. They're totally safe to be done even before 30 weeks in pregnancy. Um, all the natural stuff that we just talked about. Now, an ECV will not be attempted if you are carrying multiples, if there is any concern about the health of the baby, or if your placenta st is already starting to come away from the uterine wall, or if while they're attempting to do it, it starts to come away from the uterine wall, then obviously all of that would be stopped. Um, it, an ECV can be considered if you have had a prior cesarean birth. That does not stop you from being able to have an ECV. But again, that would be a discussion with a provider and you'll have to find a provider that supports that. As I had said, there are some risks with ECV. Um, that's why it's done in a hospital setting. One of them can be the premature rupture of membranes. So your bag of waters can break while they are performing this. Isn't that fun? They can be changes in the baby's heart rate, placental abruption. That's where that um, placenta tears apart from the uterine wall. It can cause preterm labor and it obviously could also be unsuccessful. So depending on which provider you're with, that success rate is going to be different. But there, I mean, that's one of the risks that it might not work. And then the other one can also be that they flip and then they flip back, which is so rude. But again, oftentimes they have a reason. Um, but Sometimes too, even if the baby does flip back, you can do another ECV. So maybe they're like, well, we did it at 36 weeks. It worked well. Let's try it at 37. And maybe they'll have a little less room to flip back, but we know that they're willing to move, you know? So how does this affect your birth plan? If baby flips, you're all good. Go and have the birth that you planned for. If they don't flip or your ECV was not successful, then you have to wait it out see if baby's going to flip during labor. And that's if you have a provider that's willing to deliver breach. Um, you can plan a scheduled cesarean if that is what you feel best between yourself, your baby, your provider, if that's what you would like to do. Um, some moms are more comfortable planning a cesarean birth once they know baby's breach. Totally fine. Totally up to you. It will be the option that most providers push for. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best option for you. So allow yourself to figure out if that's what you feel right doing, not just based off of a single provider's opinion or lack of ability to help you deliver a breech baby. I do want to encourage you that you can birth a breech baby. Um, and it is a great thing to be able to find, to find a provider who is trained and willing. I do understand that not all providers do this. And I, I think you wouldn't want to be with a provider that is not trained and skilled and knows what they're doing. Then it is dangerous. Um, then it does become, it makes more sense for you to have a cesarean birth. But there are providers out there that are trained and there is a new movement right now which is awesome, the way that the birth community is moving to get more providers trained to be able to offer this. Yes and no with that being inside of a hospital. It's definitely more of a movement outside of hospital. We hope that it does transfer in. And in some places, yes, they are absolutely learning that. So again, case by case basis, depending on where you are. There are also risks associated with a breech birth. And so that is important for mom to know. That's fair for you to know. Because baby's body is being born first, it may not stretch the cervix enough for the head to pass through easily. So that is something that is a pretty common situation. And it doesn't mean that baby, that you won't dilate all the way or anything like that, but it is pretty common for baby's body because it's squishier than a head to slip through or start moving through the cervix even before the, the mom is completely dilated, before you're completely dilated. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, not that you will not completely dilate. It's just that a squishy bum does not press open a cervix cervix as well as a nice hard head does. They can also be the risk of umbilical cord prolapse. So if the breech birth gets going and they have a cord that shoots down and is side by side with that body, with your baby's body, then that can be a concern because as the baby descends, eventually that head is going to push against that cord and cut off the oxygen to the baby as you are pushing them out. So sometimes it really can just be kind of pushed back to the side um, and pushed back in a lot of that depends on the situation, the provider. You're going to have to be with a provider that you know and love and trust and go off of, of what they are saying, obviously. If that cord comes first, that's a whole different situation too. So just keep that in mind. I think the biggest thing that we hear though, right, for breech birth is hands off the breech. So if, if, 
And it would be worth it to interview a provider that does breach, breach birth and ask them to walk you through the process of how breach births happen with them. And if they are like, yep, we're pretty hands off. We just allow it to happen. We're there to, you know, whatever, whatever. That's what you're looking for. Um, but a provider that's trained is going to know all of that. So it's really I think it's worth it to ask them, can you walk me through the process of what a birth, birching a breach breech baby with you would look like and listening to some responses. But I think if you are planning on giving birth to a breech baby, if that's the direction you want to go with a vaginal breech, then you'll be doing tons of research on your own anyways, all of the Google searches and finding all of the hopefully really great places to go. Like um, if you've heard of Breach Without Borders, I would head directly there and I will put a link for that in the show notes. But and that's another place that you can go to find trained providers as well. But there are organizations and good information out there that is going to give you everything you need to know so that when you're having conversations with your providers, just like you get to come and listen here and grab all that information, uh, you'll feel educated and empowered and you'll know what you're talking about and what to expect and and hope for in a good provider. Basically, with breach, it's similar to any kind of vaginal delivery. You allow mom and baby to work together, that intuition to do its thing and to have an excellent um, carefree birth in the safety of a good provider. Now to close with everything that we have discussed here today, remember that there are benefits and risks both to a breech birth and a cesarean birth. So that is good information for you to have to remember to look that up and feel good about whichever decision you are making. I want to encourage you that most moms have success with everything that I just mentioned in this episode in order to be able to flip their breech babies. Um, most or a lot. I don't ever want you to feel like, oh, shoot, my body's broken. That is not it. Remember what I said, that if you do all of these things, you pull out all the stops and it's not working your baby knows best and there is likely a reason and you won't know that until you get to the other side of things. And I want to encourage you. The good news is that even if your breech baby ends with a cesarean birth, you know, whether or not that was the first thing on your options or not, you are still a great candidate for a VBAC for future pregnancies. Having a breech baby is not like a, oh, well, now we know she's never ever going to be able to have a vaginal birth, which we know most things, even with a cesarean birth, does not mean you cannot have a vaginal birth later on. So I just want to encourage you that breech is one of those. You can absolutely go for a VBAC, your next pregnancy, should you have more babies. So keep that in mind, information in your back pocket. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next week.